I'm sure that Sarah Woodbury here is going to correct my Welsh. This is exciting. Welcome to a very special episode of 1232. We have Sarah Woodbury with us. This is part of the Never Drop Your Sword podcast. I'm Callie Sue, where we celebrate the creatively courageous. And this woman here definitely is one of those people. I'm so excited to talk to her. She's an author, historian, YouTuber, mother, all kinds of things. We're going to dive into her writings because she writes about whales and also our mutual connection to whales. So Sarah, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yes, yes. And I almost, when you, I, I almost did correct you and I yeah. refrained myself. <laughs> it's all good. It's Kroisa. Kroisa. There you go. Ah, uh, yeah. The O's uh. are like the A ah and cot everywhere. So Welsh is phonetic in that sense. So every, it's, it's consistent. Just have to, yeah. So anyway, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're good. no, it's all good. It's perfect. <laughs> I I did that a little bit on purpose so that we could get the the expert in the room. This is great. So Sarah, please for my listeners, just go ahead and introduce yourself, who you are, what you do, and where you are. Okay. So I my name's Sarah Woodbury. Uh, I write novels set in medieval Wales. Um, I have written roughly 50 novels over five series. Um, I've been writing since 2006, um, my first novel. Um, and so that's 18 years, which I, I find <laughs> astounding. Um, yeah, and so I'm I'm in my non-writer's life. Um, I'm a mom and a grandma. I have four children, two granddaughters, a husband. Um, we've been married almost 34 years now. And um, we just bought a house in Wales after coming here for so many years um, so that we can have a home base and spend a little more time since our youngest is now in, in college um, at university, as they say here. So um, we brought him to Wales with us for many years and, and now he doesn't get to come because he has to go to school. <laughs> but we're here. We, we do intend to bring them all. But That's yeah. Awesome. That is so cool. Thank you very much for, for sharing that. I am so excited to talk to you about your series. Now, we are going to get into that in just a minute, but I think that our listeners are going to find this very interesting that, you know, Sarah, you write about medieval whales. My sister and I, though we've been doing it for working on a particular story for several years, this is really our our first time really writing about whales as well. So we're gonna talk about those connections, everybody. And I think it's going to throw us all for a loop because Sarah and I were talking earlier before I hit the record button and she already said several other things that I'm like, wait, you lived in Central America too? Okay, what's going on here? This is interesting. But you know what? I want to ask you, Sarah, about your artistic journey. So did you always write? Or did you pick it up just 18 years ago? What was your plan with being an author? Was that something in your heart that you wanted to do? So, so um, I, well, when I give talks and I talk, I do talk about this because it is interesting that I did not, there was a long period of time where being an artist was not at all anything that I was, that I was. So there's a picture of me when I was like four and I'm all dressed up in my rain gear. We lived in Western Washington and I'm going to go stomp around in the swamp and, and, and really at that age and then through elementary school and up through middle school, I wrote poetry and I made up songs to myself and I did all of these artistic things to the point that until I was 12, my parents thought I was going to be a hippie. Um, and then, uh, you know, honestly, I don't know what happened, um, but I, I was also really good at school and um, I became focused academically to the point where by my late teens and 20s, I routinely said, I don't have a creative bone in my body, like believed it. I mean, I took school to its logical conclusion. I was high school valedictorian, went to college, went to grad school. I have a PhD in anthropology. Um, and so, you know, through that whole process, I remember talking to my sister-in-law, who also has a PhD, um, when I'm supposed to come up with a project that nobody has ever done before. And I'm like, I haven't had a creative thought in 12 years. Like, what, what are they expecting from me? Um, but then um, we had children at 22 um, through this process. I mean, had graduated from 
from college, but um, actually, I guess I had just turned 23. And um, so into graduate school uh, before we even started. Um, and I started seeing things differently now that I had children. Absolutely. And with that um, process, um, as particularly with the first two, um, by the time they were three and four and five, uh, we decided to homeschool. And again, with that, um, one, it meant that I did not, I stayed home. I mean, I like got my PhD, but then I wrote articles and stuff for a little while. Uh, but really I was a full-time mom. And um, I realized we finally reached a point where if I wanted my children to be creative, I needed to rediscover that part in me. And, you know, it began with not writing. It began with um, quilting, actually, because <laughs> my daughter was was very creative. And it was something that maybe that I that we could do together that, you know, I, I can sew in a straight line. Right. <laughs> stitch in an inch. Yeah, stitch um, an inch. <laughs> and and then um, I got into gardening. We actually we moved to uh, Oregon and um, and a house that that needed a lot of work, but that meant the garden was a blank slate and mm -hmm. started over that. And I designed the garden, loved so, so, both with that and quilting, discovered I loved the colors, loved um, that that part of the creative process. Right. And, then, um, and then in 2006, I uh, started my first novel just to see if I could. And, and it wasn't actually Footsteps in Time. It wasn't my first published novel. It was okay. really Lord of the Rings fan fiction is really what it was. It had okay. elves and magic swords. And um, I started it on, on April 1st, 2006, literally just to see if I could. Like I needed something else. So I had, we had four kids by then. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I sort of was reaching a point where I just, I just needed something for me. Um, right. It was four kids home all day long. Homeschooling. Something for me, right? Homeschooling. And so the youngest was two and there's a big gap there. So the next oldest was, they're six years apart. So the youngest was two, then the next was eight and then 12 and 13. So for the older kids, I could say like, interrupt me if you're bleeding, but otherwise, no. Oh, yeah. um, so I wrote my first novel during my youngest son's nap. Nice. Um, like I had an hour and a half. I sat at the kitchen counter with my laptop. I just pounded out the thing. And, um, you know, to me, well, it's objectively bad. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It, you know, that's the thing with those first those first writings, you know, a, a piece of advice I was given was like, OK, uh, congratulations. You wrote your first novel. It's your baby. Uh, print it out or whatever you want to do with it. Put it in a box and put it under your bed and do not and write something else. Exactly. Exactly. And that's and that, I didn't know that i mean this is 2006 so yeah. it's 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 not it's not pre-internet but it's early internet in the and, sense of like yeah. communities and understanding that there were like writers online like i didn't know there were writers online i'm just hanging out there doing this all by myself yeah. so i did you know i listened to no advice i had um i had written lots of nonfiction. i obviously have a phd dissertation right. that's 350 pages but 350 pages of fiction is massively different mm -hmm. how to do dialogue you know how to like beginning, middle and end and all those things. So I, so I did put that aside um, because it, I, you know, after, after actually not very long, I wrote it pretty quickly and um, I, I did edit it. I did share it a little bit. And then I don't know if you want me to segue into this, but then I had a dream. Um, no, 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 there's no way. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just oh, saying. Hold on. hold on. No, wait. No, hold on. Hold the phone. People who know me who listen to the show are going to be like, wait, what? Okay, all right. Everyone, just remember that she said she had a dream. Okay, Sarah, continue. Tell us about the dream. So, okay, so backing up for, for Wales. Yeah. Um, I had gone to, I went to Cambridge University okay. um, for a junior year abroad. Um, three friends and girlfriends and I um, drove around the UK during our, didn't come home to the US, but drove around, rented a car and ended up in Wales and particularly Conwy. Okay. 
And I just fell in love um, in Welsh. It's Nessie Sef Theo Mim Cariad. Um, fell in love with Wales, with the country, with the language, with everything, and just fantastic. So, but that's back in 1988. Um, over the over the years, I had started reading everything I could about the history of medieval Wales. Both my parents were historians. Um, my dad actually told me that we had Welsh ancestry 400 years ago, like a long time ago. A long time ago. Right? Um, but but it was there. And, um, and then um, I think in the late nineties as another homeschooling project with my daughter, we did our genealogy back when it was free, you know, like you could just right. search on the internet, you know, <laughs> yeah. and, and discovered that the, that the Welsh history ancestry was not fictive. Like it was, it was really there. It was a real day. So, you know, continuing to read, um, continuing to homeschool. And so, which is how come the summer of 2006, I had a dream where I drove my minivan into medieval Wales and saved the life of Llewellyn F. Griffith, the last Welsh Prince of Wales. Mm -hmm. um, and I woke up and I'm like, this is the story. This is the story I have to tell. It's it's so obvious that this is the story that I need to tell. Yep. And and again, it didn't end up being about me, middle-aged woman. I guess I was less middle-aged then. <laughs> um, but but you know a, a family ended up being a family of Americans time traveling to 1282 in this case. Uh, Shrelin was lured into an ambush by the English um, in, at a place called Kilmeri, and, um, and that's that's fact, right? That's yeah, that's, that's history. Fact. That's the fact. Yes, yeah. that's the real history. And so I then wrote um, this book, Footsteps in Time, which became Footsteps in Time, um, where. I change history. So, so I call the series time travel, but it's really, it's actually alternate history um, rather than actually like going back into history to change it. Um, we're actually like alternate universe, um, different tra trajectory. So that series now has 21, 20 novels yes. yeah. in it. And, um, and so basically we, we take this family from, um, 1282 well and there's a prequel called daughter of time uh, about the mom and uh and so you know she, but that starts in 1268 but anyway like that is now i think we're up to 1295 97 97 1297 um something like that one yeah. like yeah 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 <laughs> your your readers will probably correct you on that you have yes, terrific exactly. fans what year, what, what year yeah. are we in now <laughs> exactly. yes so Ah, oh, that is beautiful. That is so neat. So you were able to really, I, I, your your story is so interesting because you know I was homeschooled. My sister and I were homeschooled. My mom had she she had no degrees or anything like that. She was a very good student. She graduated early, and she had a conviction to homeschool my sister and I. So writing is everything with homeschooling, which you probably know. I don't know what curriculums you used or if you cherry picked, but my mom used a. Uh, Christian Liberty Academy. And so everything is just reading and writing. So my sister and I grew up both thankfully loving reading and writing. And that's what we just did all the time. We were both very imaginative writing stories all the time. And I knew I, I knew that my family was, was Scottish and Irish and we were all very, very proud of our heritage and our history. And so I always had an affinity and loved and studied and researched Scotland and Ireland and England. And I knew about Wales, but I didn't really understand how it fit. And I didn't grow up with internet or anything, so I couldn't like go research it. I had a couple of National Geographics that had some maps where I was able to find Wales, couldn't read any of the names on the map. So honestly did no research and didn't really know much of the lore and legend or really where many of the legends came from, which is Wales, right? But before we get too much further into that, I do want to talk about your writing process, like your lifestyle being a homeschool mom, finding that hour and a half to write. Did your kids really figure out kind of your routine or did you were you always having to adapt to your routine around them? Um, what I generally say is that the kids grew my the time I had to work, you know, expanded to fill the available space. So I started out 2006 with a two-year-old, right? And and that's like, I'm 
I I put borders around the writing time. Um, maybe a little bit in the evening, but I'm a morning person, so generally not. It would be you know when he took a nap, and then um, as time went on and they grew older, especially like so the eldest was 13 then in 2006, you know, she had she ended up going off to college, you know, like mm -hmm. they progressed and um, there was more time for me, maybe like they're working on their own things and I'm working on my thing. And we had, yeah. you know, we, we had computer, our computers together, like no computers yeah. in the bedrooms or anything. And so, um, you know, our youngest would be sitting at his computer, writing an essay or whatever for me. And I'd be, you know, working on my book, that kind of thing. And so we were right there, you know, actually at one point we had, one of our sons came home from um, when the the oldest son came home from college, having graduated just at the point that the, the next one in line went to college, but I still had three. So I had this line of the three, you know, me, one son, one son, yeah. all, you know, <laughs> working together. Um, and so, you know, now you know they're gone and and it's like I have to actually now I have to put borders around the writing in a ah. way like I have to protect my time rather than um working 15 hours a day you know that's so so it's sort of a different process it's evolved as they have as they have grown but you know when my children were little like I wrote my dissertation during Sesame Street basically like right. I like it was like you know this is and and particularly with the writing novels for the first five years um this is all pre-ebook right mm -hmm. so there were no ebooks I was looking for agents looking for publishers mm -hmm. once I got an agent um so those five years um I it wasn't a job in the same way that it became it is now Right. right. Um, there was no income. Um, you know, it it sort of had my real job was homeschooling the kids. Yep. Um on one hand, it didn't it didn't cost anything, I guess. You know, like and that that was really the thing. My husband and I would talk about like, you know, after so many years of rejection, mm -hmm. like, should I just quit? Like, is this dumb? And he's like, You love writing. So, you know, and it, it isn't costing us any, you know, so you're not yeah. you're not gonna I'm not gonna be out there going to a job. It's not stopping me from doing those things. My job is right is homeschooling the kids. So um, you know, do it, do it around it is really, really what I did. But again, you know, by the time, well, I guess so five years I published um as an indie author, you know, the first book in in January of 2011, um, which made my youngest eight. Okay. Almost almost eight. Um, and again, you know, he'd have a friend over, hoo -hoo, right? Yeah. <laughs> Mom's on the computer. Oh, yeah. He's got a friend over there building Legos. <laughs> you know, that kind exactly. of thing. That's yeah. awesome. You know, there's so many women out there that are absolutely amazing, homeschooling their kids, uh, balancing career, or even doing writing. My sister is one of those, Cheyenne. She has is homeschooling her two kiddos. They're very close in age. They're wild little hellions, and we love them very much. And they're always outside playing. So you she she gets to get her riding time in but she's really got to watch them because they'll get up on a horse or a, some kind of crazy animal and take off and that's exactly what she and i used to do to our mom so she's she's getting the comeuppance and and if i have kiddos i probably will too <laughs> but... well you know and and you know one of the things people ask ask me about that because basically i wrote in in chaos you know four kids and it, they were fantastic but, um, but I had, you know, like I, I was, I could multitask and I could also like write for 10 minutes and, and switch and then write for 10 more minutes and switch. And really what I would say is like, if I don't do it this way, it doesn't happen at all. Mm -hmm. So those are my choices. I could not write, or I could do it where I have to like be in the moment really quickly. You know, right. there lots of people talk about, oh, I need, you know, I need, 20 minutes to like straighten yeah. my desk and then I light a candle and then I, I'm just like, I don't have time for that, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that, you know, I think that's going to speak to a lot of people that, that listen to the show that are a part of our little world and your listeners and readers too, I'm sure is many, many folks are struggling with that. It's like, man, I, I, if only I could 
you know, set it up so nice and have all the music and the atmosphere, but really that, that, that isn't what produces, not always, I guess it does produce plenty of great art, but it's not always what produces art and creativity in us. Sometimes it takes that chaos and that adversity to really get us to kind of fight for that creativity just a little bit and and say no this is what i'm doing i've only got a short amount of time so best best opinions yeah. best options <laughs> exactly. only i can't waste we're going time. now and you know that's the thing is when cheyenne and i were writing 1232 it is been a 14 year long journey writing it because it started out as a film script uh based off of a dream and then we made a, a short film of it in New Mexico, got all my cowboy friends to dress up like medieval knights and uh, made the costumes, the whole thing. And then, you know, then my sister was like, hey, I think this is actually a novel. Like it's got so much more to it. And she had gone to school for writing and journalism. And I really lent into her, like really leaned into her strengths of that and getting that going. And so we started writing and literally the first several months she was off at college we were mailing copies of yeah. work to <laughs> each other it. you know yeah. we, and, and then then we yeah. finally got usb drives and we were doing that and then she got married and, and had kiddos and lived out on a ranch and i was touring in a band and so like internet was you know we it was just now getting good where you could do like shared google docs and stuff but we were emailing each other and so that's it just it's interesting how life's journey really shapes you as a writer one of my favorite things about the idea of writing as a career is that it's it has no prejudice when it comes to age because it is such a journey so much of your life shapes and molds it sometimes you need more life experiences sometimes you know, you've got that short window of time or it's put off for years. I mean, it took you a long time to get your first book out from starting the writing journey, editing and working. And you are now um, represented by a, a publishing company. You now do that, right? Through Well, actually it's our publishing company. Oh, it is? Okay, that's, you know, it's that's our, what I yeah. thought. Yeah. So, so I'm still an indie author in that sense. I mean, so, but it's a business, we're a S Corp, I guess. Yep. Um, and, and honestly, so back in 2011, um, where there was such a, a stigma against being, a uh, indie author, mm -hmm. um, there, there sort of was like, you know, it was my own publishing company. I was now a publisher. And so I put this in the Morgan Stanwood publishing group. Right. Um, and, but, you know, and, but a lot of it, there was this element where, you know, being, uh, indie, well, it was called self-publishing. Yes. Self-publishing was selling books out of the trunk of your car. Mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, you know, and and somehow, you know, like creating this publishing house implied that I was, there was something which more it, than that, exactly. which, it, which it is more than that, you know, at this point. Well, I mean, now it's this big thing where it both my husband and I work for the publishing company. You know, we have audiobooks and we have paper and hardback and, you know, eBooks, of course, and all of that. And it's just a much YouTube so just much bigger endeavor. And I'm really glad that I started out with, you know, with this, I knew nothing, you know, like we're just making it up. Um, and and that, that that was actually sort of a, a one of the right things that I did um, way back, you know, way back then. That's awesome. Yes, exactly. You know, that's the thing. You got to be thinking ahead just a little bit. There's those tricky things in the entertainment business where, you know, what legitimizes what. And even now, while indie authors and self-published is, is not looked down upon or really frowned upon too much. In fact, big publishing companies will shop for indie authors who have a book that's done well and then they'll pick them up, et cetera. It's still, you know, there's still that fight for legitimization. Why are indie musicians cool and indie authors not? Like, <laughs> right. seriously. Like, you know. Yeah, exactly. Why? Exactly. That's not fair. And, you know, why do indie filmmakers get all the grants, but indie musicians do not? <laughs> yeah. It, it just kind of goes down that chain. But you know what? That's all right. It's, everybody's got their they're bolder. They got to push uphill, I guess. And that's. Yeah. That's well, and, and the truth is, and maybe that maybe, you know, the indie musicians and indie filmmakers feel the same way. But I mean, the best thing that ever happened to me was to not. 
-hmm. get a traditional contract. Absolutely the best thing ever. And, and I'm incredibly grateful that I was rejected. My books were rejected for five years. You know, like you don't know that in, at, at the time, you know, yep. you don't know that, that this adversity that you're facing is actually going to work. Out. Right. Well, and it would have been easy to quit too. And, and, and I'm not really one of those people who like, oh, you should just, you know, keep going, you know, like mm -hmm. just persevere because sometimes it is smarter mm -hmm. to quit. You know, quitting's okay. Um, uh, but in my case, again, because I, I, I was enjoying it and it wasn't costing us anything and it was, it, it was added to our lives rather than subtracted. Um, you know, I just kept going until the point came where I could actually publish my own books. That's awesome. That's great. And you've been able to, to turn out so many wonderful stories. And, you know, this is, this is where we can kind of go ahead and get back into some of those fun things that we hinted at earlier. So you knew you had Welsh history and heritage in your family or like several hundred years ago. And you actually on your website, you have an incredible where you've done the research uh, on your, your family's name, Woodbury. And that's really fascinating for folks who want to check out Sarah's website. There will be the link in the description below. Please do that and her books. And that is, do you think that's really what kind of influenced your dream was that trip that you had back in the eighties your research and your study, did a lot of that kind of research come before you wrote Footsteps in Time or? Yeah, I think it was definitely like I read everything I could get my hands on about medieval Wales. I mean, and, and because I have a PhD, you know, like research yep. are us. Mm -hmm. um, so yes. like I was, I, this is, I didn't know that's what I was doing in 2003 when I read some history book about medieval Wales. Right. But um, in retrospect, hey, that was great. That was a good idea <laughs> because, you know, the, when the time came to actually write it, um, I had I had all this background, you know, and and, you know, I, I work very hard to make the history. Well, as ac the history is as accurate as I can make it, except when it isn't because it's alternate history. Right. But the, <laughs> but who these who these people are like mm -hmm. I have invented characters and then I have the real characters who was Swell and F. Griffith, who, you know, who, uh, who, who were his advisors, you know, what was, what events were happening in time that, um, that my, that would still be happening, you know, even, even when I change history, um, you know, even if I essentially like as a character allow someone to live a little longer, maybe then they would have, there's a reason for that, you know, the, the, yeah. the because, you know, it's like the, in a sense, maybe the butterfly effect as well, but medicine is better because I have these American, you know, like it, 15 years on, there's been changes in the world that will allow um, cer certain things and certain bad things. I mean, it's actually interesting. Some of the latest books, um, particularly the latest one, I talk about unintended consequences because one of the things that my characters bring is sort of that American optimism and and mm -hmm. democracy and and you know freedom of speech and religion and you know all the men and women are equal you know these kinds of things um to this medieval world and sometimes there's consequences to change mm -hmm. that aren't all good just maybe just for a few people but like there are repercussions and, and ripple ripple effects. And, and that's been interesting to explore as well. Like, obviously I saved Suelen's life. So, right. you know, so Wales is different, right? <laughs> Wales is different from that point on. Um, but, you know, there's big and small, you know, right. big and small changes. Exactly. And, you know, so did, had you read 1632 or anything from from him before? Had you read Timeline or seen the film? Oh, everything. I've read everything. everything. I've right. read everything. You know, whether it was, you know, Outlander, right. um, Outlander. Timeline, 1632. 1632 is one of my all-time favorite books. Yes. Um, uh, you know, uh, Stephen Lawhead, he doesn't do that, but he oh, does yeah. tons of King Arthur stuff. Yes. So I love King yeah. Arthur. And Cycle. Um, yeah. And, and, um, um, as well, like, um, what, uh, what was I going to say? 16th or timeline, timeline, you know, timeline's got a 13% approval rate, the movie, 13% mm -hmm. yes. approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes. And it's like, I actually own the movie because. Me too. <laughs> I love so the movie. It is. Yeah, you know? 
Oh my goodness. I, I think it's terrifically entertaining. I read the book many years later. Um, yes, and I, I'm a huge Michael Crichton fan, but I had not read that book. And I read it years and years later and was just like, oh my gosh, this is the best thing. But wait a minute, it happens in New Mexico too. So just for the listeners. Right. Oh, gotta, right. It we, is in New Mexico, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah. We've got to address the elephant in the room. Oh my gosh, how similar are our stories? I've got a brother and sister who, who go back in time to medieval Wales in the year 1232. You know, we'll have to talk about a little bit about our time travel type mechanisms that we use. And... Uh, alternating history just a little bit, um, interjecting a little bit of Americanism into medieval Wales. But I think that kind of goes hand in hand because as the stories go, which I completely believe, the Welsh have been influencing America a lot longer. A lot. And in years previous, when we can talk about Madog if you want, and the different, uh, the natives in Alabama, but we'll let our listeners kind of research some of that I came to all of the Welsh history and legend and storytelling and just richness after I already wrote the script for 1232. So what had happened was I I was like you with Wales with Scotland. I loved Scotland. I read everything, ingested everything. It was so into it. I had this dream about a brother and sister going back in time and dealing with kind of more you know mythical not too many historical figures but more mythical things that i had read in different fairy tales and enchantresses and magic and everything was arthurian legend for me i wrote a film called cowboys in king arthur's court absolutely taking on the connecticut yankee in king arthur's court kind of thing and putting it western blah 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 and so i just had a huge passion for that and so I really wanted to write a film script. I wrote a 90 page film script, went to my folks, I think I was 16, and I said, hey, I wanna make a movie. And they're like, Callie, we can't make a 90 page, what are you talking about? How, where? And I was like, no, I really wanna do it. And this was before we had all these great phones and wonderful ways to do this. This was um, 2007. Uh, eight and nine that we kind of prepped for this film in 2009 we actually shot it and what we did was we we took the script and we chopped it down my uncle is involved in film he helped me chop it down into like more of a sh like a short trailer or kind of extended trailer type deal to tell the story but what I did was like I said I knew nothing about Wales I knew it existed I knew that people were Welsh but didn't know anything else I knew that Avalon was probably in Wales uh, that's all I knew and I did not want to place my story in Scotland in 1232 because I knew too much. I was like, well, I don't know exactly how to put my story. I'm too loyal to the history to put my story in here. So I want it to be medieval in a time frame, a time period that I really love. And I want it to be in Britain. I'm just going to put it in Wales. Nobody knows anything about Wales. Nobody's gonna, no, who, who's gonna come at me? You know, like what's gonna happen? Nobody knows anything. So like I said, I pulled down a National Geographic from my grandfather's collection and there was a map of the United Kingdom in there. And I looked at Wales and I picked the one town on there I could pronounce, Brecon. Great, perfect. And some mountains, I dig it. And that is honest, honest to God, the only research I did, period. So I used that for my script. I wrote, it was a very Western style script, to be honest, you know, our good guys are, they've got their hideout out in the cave and, you know, the castle is made of wood because it's in the middle of construction. We've got this evil enchantress, the black sorceress is kind of controlling it and, and we've got these rebels and, you know, very typical, very influenced from all the action films and fantasy films that I grew up watching. So I was far more into film than I was into novel writing. I had not read Timeline. I had not read 1632. And I had seen Timeline the movie, but I had not really investigated that further. I had read Stephen R. Lawhead, uh, The Pin Dragon Cycle, and I just loved the, the rich history that he brought out. But I didn't quite understand how it fit into Wales. Like I said, I, I was so hyper-focused on Scotland that I just didn't really care. And so then... We made the short film, We had a, everyone had so much fun, we made the costumes, we did the thing, 
uh, came up with our own emblems for everybody, for the, the royal family that we had involved, um, named the main character Cardigan, because that's another name I could pronounce. <laughs> pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> and that was like, that was the end of the Welsh stuff. I mean, I even put yeah. a Scottish priest in there, okay? And, yeah. and then an opportunity came for my sister and I, I we had already written the majority of the novel and then of course the script, we changed a lot. A lot of things changed and grew, but we kept the main characters, Rona and Flint. We kept Brecken, we kept it set in Wales and we kept the year and pretty much everything else changed. And then we were like, we really need to go there. And I couldn't wait to get back to Scotland, planned a backpacking trip. We're like, we'll just go through Wales on our way. We uh, landed in London went to Abergavenny, which we then learned was Abergavenny. <laughs> and, you know, you get, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, say it, say it in, in a Welsh for me. Then, and we missed our train because we were like, whoa, not, nobody said Abergavenny. And then we learned it was Abergavenny. And then we just started we just started backpacking through. We made it to Brecon. That's when we found out about the caverns there. We found out that the castle in during that time period was made of wood, wasn't ever all the way finished. We found out that there was a resistance rebel group. Um, I found out that there's a town called Flint, the Ramda Valley, and just all of these things that were in my dream about Brecon or about where the story took place physically existed in Brecon, even how we describe the landscape, the mountains, and you know, some of that would just be intuition and, and writing, but we were using it all as a plot device. And here it was in front of us. And we were just, we were just like, what? It was just crazy. So then, then we're like, we got to know more about this place. <laughs> we got to learn a lot more history. We got to, we got to figure it out. And so we did, but my yours your books are most definitely far more historically accurate mine are complete alternate universe type situations you know um in mine Llewellyn dies sooner <laughs> rather oh, than later <laughs> interesting <laughs> yeah and, and well we have... there are two Llewellyns there are two yeah. Llewellyns yeah yeah um there's yeah there's uh Llewellyn the Great and then who died is... in 1240 Right. Normally. Yeah. Died Normally. in 1240. And then Swellen Ep Griffith is his grandson. His grandson. Exactly. And that's my, that's sort of my. Your, yeah, that's your Swellen. Yeah, exactly. And so we, you know, we had to, in order to keep our story, we, we fixed a few things and we tried to do a lot of different research into Brecon. And really it was going through, like many places during that time, a lot of turmoil. We had the Marcher Lords coming in. We had, uh, so there was just this nice little gap in time where there isn't a whole lot of history because a bunch of it got destroyed. And so I said, boom, that's where, this was what happened then. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's actually definitely one of those trade-offs is that, is that um, you know, my Swellen, they don't even know when he was born. Right. He's yeah. just like, there's a general vague idea, you mm -hmm. know, how could they not know? I mean, they're not even totally sure who his mother was. Um, how can they not know? Like there's, got, you know, but it, but uh, so much was destroyed during the conquest, mm -hmm. and um, and and that's interesting because now what my fifth series that I started back in 2019 has four novels in it now, and it's set after the conquest, um, during the time of Edward, nice. and and Edward, I mean the English keep records. Yes, um, they destroyed the Welsh records, fine, but they keep their own records, and so it's almost like. Oh, well, there's way too much information. Yeah. Like, like, Dang I it. Wait, <laughs> I know. It's like, uh, wait a minute. I'm used to just making this stuff up. No. Um, but yes, there, there exactly. is like, oh, Edward was actually, like, they know where he was at each given moment. And mm -hmm. there's nothing like that for Swillen. You just, um, at all. Um, yep. Other than the fact that he was at Kilmeddy when he died. So, um, right. yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, there's so many, there's so many of those little, I had to go back to different kind of historical type writings from, you know, the 1800s, the 1700s to really try to figure out Brecon, but it was just an agricultural spot. 
you know, and, and there wasn't, there's, like you said, like the marcher lords came through and the different conquests and just various things that happened. There was a rebellion of some uh, Welsh farmers against the marcher lords in that area. And that's how the wooden part of the castle got burned down. And then, you know, the stone really, it never became a major fortress. And also with it being up there in the mountains, it, it wasn't 100% conquered either. Like everyone was just kind of left to a lot of their own devices and, and there was better fortresses around it, you know, for, for when the martial lords came and William Marshall was taken and everybody was building castles across it, you know. And so I was just like, all right, well, I'm just going to put it here in this little time and place. And I was able to incorporate a lot more historical things, but not too much because it didn't serve my purposes. So I, I would grab on various different fairy tales and folk tales. You know, um, one of my favorites is, it goes by several different names, but there's a Welsh farmer who is trekking into the, made, the city always changes depending on which story you read. But he comes across an old man who has a, uh, a confrontation with him just a little bit and he tells him about King Arthur's labyrinth and the treasure that's buried underneath in these caverns. I don't know if you've heard this one. And you know you can recognize it by the the type of tree that is planted there. You go in, you strike the golden bell and then all of King Arthur and his knights are there and the treasure and King Arthur will rise again to to save you know Britain at Wales, Wales actually, of course. But now, at the time, yeah, yeah, exactly. at the time. And because this, so I was like, all right, King Arthur's Labyrinth, okay, I can use that. There was a, her, she was called the Black Sorceress during that time. There's another legend of how she swooped in and took over, and I was like, all right, I can use that. And so just kind of grabbed a bunch of those fun things. So 1232 has some very similar things to yours. The main characters, Rona and Flint, we ended up making them originally they were teenagers but we ended up making them older because we wanted to explore some more spiritual side to things and really talk about the paganism versus the catholicism that was going on in the area and i know that you you definitely touch on that too and ours was wanting to to paint that in historical but human way you know, mankind has not really changed that much. Um, of course, technologies, this, that, and the other thing, maybe we're in a different cycle right now to where sure women can vote, but there were other time, periods of time in history, especially if we study the Celts where women held high honor. So this is just another cycle we're in, you know? And we so we really wanted to take the focus from not just an action adventure and historical realm, but let's make it about the spiritual importance of people who are living uh, a very present day-to-day -day life, who are dealing with life and death constantly. And let's put somebody who, two people who are from modern day America, who are pretty comfortable and we make bad choices because we get to, you know, and it doesn't offer life and death consequences so much. I mean, it does sometimes, but you know, but no, no, I actually totally, I totally, totally get that. I mean, um, so two things I will say. So I have a series called The Last Pendragon Saga, mm -hmm. which addresses that. Like it's yeah. it's the the pagan versus the Christian, you know. Yes. And so yeah. you know that that so there's that whole that. But also, you know, I was just talking to my husband the other day about how, you know, technology that we have now, like thinking about where we are sort of in history right now and how technology kind of um it soothes us into thinking that we are better off mm -hmm. i guess you know Arrogance. and if you and and if you think about like the people of that time you know they they maybe they didn't question their faith but they also like were secure in it in a way like everybody you know, yes. there wasn't the same. So, and so maybe like actually living back then would have been easier. You know, we think about hot showers, right? That's like, yes. <laughs> like yeah. where's my hot shower? But, you know, but like the, the constant where every single 18 year old is supposed to like come up with the reason for the universe on his own, you know, 
that wasn't that wasn't happening there. You know, like you had you had a really clear way of looking at the world and and you know, maybe we could say now that there were some, you know, flaws in it, but at the same time, um, you know, it, it's interesting like our assumptions about that things are so much better. And sure. in many, many ways there are. Absolutely. Yes. But at, at the same time, um, I think that that, you know. I felt like my job, one of my jobs in writing books set in medieval Wales is to translate the medieval world for a modern audience in a way that they can relate to it. I mean, I think that's like really the job of a of someone who writes books set in that time period is because you need to make those people people in a way. Um, honestly, as an anthropologist, that's the job too, except for yeah. it was modern. So we would go to, you know, you, you go, you go to wherever in our place, we lived in Belize. Um, you go to Belize, you know, you, you, you live with these people for a year and a half, and then you translate these cultural differences, which even if, even if, so there's language similarities, even as, but culturally speaking, they're different. And then that's the job is to make all people, people in yeah. that regard in the same way with the middle ages. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I lived in Belize too, as a child. Um, <laughs> Ah, so that's just that's just funny. I mean, my my family was down there. My my real dad, my biological father, was working at a water buffalo ranch down there. And um, it, out, outside Orange Walk Town, outside the capital, there, yes. And um, we, I was quite young. I, I thankfully have very good memory, even as a, a, a wee child. But I was only four at the time, so I don't have all, if I had my mom or my sister on the call, she'd be able to, they'd both be able to correct me on a lot of this. But we, we lived down there for almost a year and a half, I, I believe, because I had a birthday there and, and different things like that. And it was a wild adventure, turned a little sour, we ended up going back, you know, it, my biological father had uh, an interesting way of living life. And so, um, you know, we, he drug us all down there to live and, and it was wild. It was wild, but we don't have to go into stories of that, but we did get to visit some of the, you know, I don't even, we went to this one temple somewhere. Mine ruins. They're mine yes, ruins. Yeah, so yeah, you, yeruins. You probably yeah, went exactly. to the, like the Nantanet. You probably went to the Nantanet. Which is um, <laughs> the closest? It's in Belize. It's like one of the big ones okay, in Belize. Yeah, and they were yeah. doing excavations. So we were in Punta Gorda, which is at like the end of the the road the in the road. south. <laughs> okay. Um, it, yeah. Um, so, but but at the time, I mean, I know they've excavated more since then. But we were there in '93 and '94, and Zanantinich was the real one to go to. Okay. You probably. Yeah. Weren't. I was there in, yes, I was. <laughs> Thank you. But no, uh, we were there in 95 and 96. So, yeah. So just, just there during that time. Um, that's crazy. That's wild. I mean, I suppose, I, I guess, I guess the world is getting smaller, but it's just so funny. Our, our different little crop path crossing here. Uh, that's so fascinating. I think that there's definitely a reason for that. One, that we are now friends because we proclaimed that earlier. <laughs> we proclaimed our friendship earlier. And two, you know, I think I've heard in a couple of your interviews and I just absolutely love this. And while I was in Brecon this last year, I was doing research for, for book two, which is season three of the audio epic, but it will be in book form. We will be releasing them as, as novels, but the, I'll get into why they're in audio in just a minute, but I was sitting in the cathedral there and going through the graveyards. I love how, you know, it, on each headstone, it had who was who in the village. You know, this was, this was a, a farmer. This was the cobbler. This was all these different things and how many men and women uh, volunteered to go and fight World War One, World War Two from Brecon. And I'm just, I'm absolutely overwhelmed by the incredible stories and people that come from such this little place. Yeah, that nobody, nobody knows about. Yeah, everybody's focused on, you know, Ireland. Ireland's fantastic. I've been to Ireland. I love Ireland. I live there for three months. I, 
no qualms there. I, of course, I love everything Irish. Been to Scotland, love Scotland. That's where my heart is. Uh, of course, it's popular. Of course, it's amazing. Of course, Outlander is, is you know, doing wonderful things for it. But I was just so struck by those voices that rose out of the ground. I was like, I, 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 I got to tell the story of these people. I have got to carry on the legacy of Brecken, of, of these incredible men and women and doing it in, you know, in my own way, you know, I should probably ask them how they'd like it done, but, you know, <laughs> getting yeah, to talk you to know, locals and uh, people are really generous, you know, like yes. here I'm, I come here and I'm this crazy American, right? <laughs> who writes 50 novels set in medieval Wales, like yeah. who does that? Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, like every, every day that we're here, because we're here in Carnarvon right now, um, you know, I, I talk to somebody, um, whether in Welsh or English, and it, it is very rarely not a great interaction, mm -hmm. you know, like people, people are generous. Um, they're happy to, they don't care that I'm a crazy American or actually yeah. they're super excited that somebody else is excited about Wales. Exactly. And, and the, and the, the difference I think too, is that, you know, they know how special where they live is like, like I've talked to so many people who are like, why would you want to go anywhere else? Like, seriously, why? Cause this is the most beautiful place in the world. Um, maybe there's more sun somewhere else or right. whatever, but ah, sun's um, overrated. <laughs> yeah. Sun's overrated. And, but, um, but, but then to know also that, that I care so much, you know, I've learned Welsh. Um, I'm trying to be historically accurate. I'm, I'm telling their history to an audience that is you know it's it's not exclusively american it's about half american now it certainly was much more american when i first started writing but like two million people know about wales who may never who have, if they before they downloaded daughter of time did not know anything about wales and all of a sudden there's there's this opportunity to share what they love so much with other people be, through my books, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and I was really nervous when I first came to Wales because it's like, Oh, I'll write these books and I hope you like them. And, yeah. but to, you know, to now have so many Welsh readers who do like them, I start to feel more confident, um, yes. about, about that, you know, about the, the prod of what I'm actually, what I'm actually doing or trying to do. Yes. Yeah, that is so, it's so daunting. You know, uh, though I've gotten to travel a lot and I and I do have uh, friends and acquaintances in different places, you know, being part of the indie artist world, you know, you got to work with what you got a lot of times and what you got sometimes is is absolutely incredible and you, you really don't realize it till you, till you put it down. And sometimes you have to be like, well, that's not perfect, but we'll make it work, you know? And whenever we were, we were querying 1232 as the novel and we got a couple of different publishers involved. I too am glad that, that it wasn't accepted and that it got rejected because it did birth this whole new medium of telling the story. But, you know, people are like, oh, well, you know, it's, it's too Christian because you've got a priest who's always, you know, quoting scripture and, and talking about all of that. And I'm like, well, that's what he would have done. I mean, what else would well, he Well, that have? is true. I mean, that what, is true. what other, he's not going to be quoting yeah. Joel Olstein, you know, he's yeah. going to be quoting, yeah. you know, Paul for heaven's sakes. Right. Um, and then, you know, oh, then Christian publishers are like, oh, it's, it's not Christian enough. Your main, one of your main characters doesn't become a Christian in the end. You've got this kind of mix of like, sorcery and exorcism and da, 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 da. and so I was you know a lot of authors who who write Christian speculative fiction find themselves in this in between wasteland where people are like eh, it doesn't really fit in a box and thankfully the the Lord comes into it and he's like that's okay I don't want it to here you go and so he didn't publish the novel and we we're like well you know Maybe, maybe I could do an audio book. You know, I, I do the podcast, do the music, do all this sort of stuff. 
And then I was like, I don't really want to do all the character voices because it's predominantly male characters in the book. While one of the main characters is Rona, she's a girl, and the evil enchantress, and so there's not a lot of girls in it. And then I'd have to do a lot of male voices. Didn't feel confident in that. And then I started thinking like, oh, I know an actor in Santa Fe who does like Shakespearean plays. He does, um, oh, why is it leaving me? The Welsh Christmas story that's very famous. Oh, the uh, Dylan Christmas. Thomas. Yeah, Dylan yeah. Thomas. A, 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 child, a, child's a Child's Christmas in Wales. Yes, yeah, A Child's Christmas in Wales. Yeah. He does a lot of Dylan Thomas. Like he knows how to do stuff like this. And then next thing you know, I was sitting there with my husband and I would say it's my husband's idea, not mine. Um, we all of a sudden had a full cast of people that I knew who were professionals who had wanted to do it before or, you know, could help me with it. And that's how the audio epic was born. Full narration like an audio book, full dramatization, and the immersive sound, and of course, being able to write the music. And then I was actually able, you, you'll find this fun for the second season. I wrote a song that all my resistance fighters sing, you know, the night before the battle. And you know, because there's plenty of old Irish songs and there are a lot of Welsh songs, but it's, you know, so many of them are in Welsh. And I'm like, I, yeah, yeah. I can't I don't yeah. Know how to translate. So I wanted to just go ahead and write something that really fit the story. So we wrote a song and I was like, man, I would love to get this in Welsh to include, you know, with the written story and all this stuff. And my Airbnb host that I stayed with in Brecon, uh, she had put in her profile under speak Welsh. I'm like, I'm really trying to learn. And I actually have this song that I'd really like to get translated into Welsh. Do you know anyone who could do it? And she's like, oh, well, my husband would like to take a look at it. He could do it. And I said, oh, great. It's awesome. So I emailed it to him. And <laughs> a few weeks later, before I came and stayed, um, let me see if I can find this real quick. He translated it for me and I was like okay thank you so much and he's like and I went ahead and translated it into the proper Welsh that was spoken in that time oh my so, gosh what is he like whoa. a historian or something even crazier and his name is escaping me because I'm so excited about it so give me just one second I'm going to find it in my email here um I was so elated His name is Graham Davies, and he, I, after he did that, I was like, man, who is this person? How did this even happen? And he is winner of the Wales Arts Council Book of the Year. He oh, wow. Is, yes, he is a historian. He speaks and writes in, you know, Welsh of the 11th and 12th century and earlier. And he has won a ton of awards. He's a sought after lyricist for composers who are either doing it in Welsh or in English or anything for classical works. Like he's a, a big wig. And I had no idea. <laughs> There's this You're just little, like, oh yes, please translate like, this oh, yeah, for yeah, me. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> and, you know, and I just couldn't believe it. And he's like, I went ahead and included different words and, and translations that harken back to other like wartime songs written in that time so if anybody who knows what their knows their history can read that song and be like oh that's just like such and such ballad you know and i was i was i was absolutely that's amazing gobsmacked by that so it's it's amazing what will happen when you reach out and ask just like with you i was so intimidated to talk to you because i'm like our stories are too similar and she's gonna think i copied her and and i don't she's never gonna talk to me like i don't know what's gonna happen and then i finally was like okay I'm sending this email and it responded <laughs> so quickly, which was amazing. So Aww. I really appreciate that. that is well, so you know, I think it's a, I think it's a, um, it's a big enough pond, let's just say. Yeah. Um, and honestly, because I, I do care so much about whales and, and, um, and I want to share that, you know, I think you, you reach an audience that I don't reach, you know, and within, as the pot with the podcast and with, exactly. you know, with your, I have, you know, I have connections over here and you have connections over there, like this Graham Davies person, like I that's know. astounding. <laughs> like, where did that come from? So, yeah. 
Well, that's, you know, that's a huge part of, you know, how my, my spiritual life plays into what I write and what I do and I produce is my relationship with Jesus Christ. And, you know, like you were saying earlier, it, it was such, it was far more common for people to talk about God or talk about that, or it was just, it was just part of the vernacular, Godspeed, you know, and, and that we lose sight of that when it comes to talking about back then, you know, all the, during the dark ages, during all this kind of stuff, people want to think that they were just backwards, superstitious, crazy people when, when really, like you said earlier, no, that part of their life, the spiritual belief part was kind of the most consistent thing, you know? Right. Well, and, 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 and honestly in, in Wales, so, so Wales was conquered by Rome, right? 410, they march away, but they converted to Christianity in three under Constantine. And so when they walked away, Christianity was one of the things they left. So some of the first Christians outside of, you know, whatever, Italy or, um, yeah. were Welsh of all things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so like, we love visiting all the little churches and, and holy wells and these mm -hmm. kind of things, um, named for the saints. So the fifth and sixth century, which is really early is the age of saints, um, in Wales. And, you know, Saint and Patrick. that's working right. Well, and St. Patrick was Welsh, obviously. Yeah. And, but like, I mean, there's, this is a zillion of them. And like, you can go to one of our favorite places to visit is a place called, um, now I, of course, now I can't remember, <laughs> Shangalenin. It's called Shangalenin, but Galenin, Helenin is the name of the saint. And um, it's, that church is built in the 11th century and over the top of a much older one, it's got a little holy healing well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's up uh, above Conwy. And you go there and you're just like, well, one, people have worshipped here for thousands of years. I mean, probably actually for many of these places, the 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 thing that happened in Wales is that the church was not structured. So so um, as people, pe there was, it was sort of really a, this fluid feeling of from moving from paganism to Christianity. And they would, there would be a holy person like Kalenin and people would gather and they would listen to him and then they'd build a little church and then they'd, they'd have this little healing well. And, and, you know, those places became little towns would grow up next to them. And so in, in Welsh, Shan, like everything's Shan, Shan Bera, Shan, uh, Shan Galenin, Shan, Shan Vaglin, Shan, you know, and Shan means church enclosure, like holy, holy enclosure. And it's like, there's a thousand place names in Wales that begin with Shan. Um, and it's just like that history, you know, if you think about where just like the words you use on the landscape and everyone is saying shan all the time, L-L-A-N is how it's pronounced, meaning holy place, holy, holy location, you know, like our, where we live is Shan Galenin, Shan Rakwin, Shan, and so on. Anyway, um, you know, I, I think about one of the things that with, with that process is like that really really old christianity that is rooted in the history of wales i think people don't know like they don't know saint patrick was welsh right mm -hmm. but that he was actually a missionary to ireland um and maybe they'll get that part but not like that he was born in south yeah. wales you sure. know <laughs> and um and you know and and that 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 sort of that process was really organic in a way that I think was maybe less less the case in in some other places um, as as it moved among the people and well they even um, they even have a story uh, a telling of Merlin where Merlin was baptized and became a Christian. Well, the whole King Arthur. I mean, that is a fifth century. I mean, uh, the Battle of Mount Baden is mm -hmm. five hundred, right? Yep. Roughly. And, you know, and, and, and so much of that story is, is a con conflict, of, but it's a, it's a, it's a spiritual conflict between the Christian Welsh who weren't Welsh yet, but you know, the Britons mm -hmm. and the Saxons who were pagan, yeah. um, you know, and, and that was that we have letters that the, the Britons um, wrote to Constantinople, which had become the center of Christianity, mm -hmm. begging the Romans to return to protect them from these pagans who were coming in and taking over. And they're like, you were your brothers and sisters and you've left us. And they're like, 
Sorry. Sorry, can't <laughs> make for it yourself. We're, Sorry. We're also getting <laughs> sacked by Higgins over here. Yes, so. that's right. Yeah. So, but I mean, like over and over and over again, we have, my husband and I have a talk that we give about the history of, you know, the, the multi-thousand year history of Britain. And very often that's what it is. It's like, you know, the, the, the Romans come, everyone sort of becomes Christian with a blend of paganism that, that sort of goes on. But by the time the Saxons come, everyone's Christian, you know, many, many anyway are Christian. And then, um, you know, and then the Saxons convert to Christianity and the Danes come and they're pagan. And yes. then so so then you have a whole island that's Christian, except for the Danes who are taking over and they take over half the country, half of England. Yeah. And everyone's like, whoa, you know, come help us. And then, um, you know, it's like wave after wave after wave of um, where there's then these, you know, the people then convert to Christianity, convert to Christianity. And finally, once they once they settle and um, yeah, you know, and and I think it's it's a whole it's a whole way of looking at um, people's, you know, thinking about like the people lived during that time. Like they, they had real lives. It's not just like on the screen um, where they, they went from day to day to day to day. And as you said, you know, their, their connection to life and death was closer, so much closer than we who protect ourselves from it. I mean, whether it's um, because we live so long, honestly, like, you know, right. there's, there's, you know, until your grandparents die, maybe you don't really know, you might not know anyone who's died or had anyone close to you who died. Um, whereas back then it's like, yeah, you know, brothers, yeah. sisters, aunts, Sister, uncles, you know, yes. every, it's, it's a constant thing. And I think that also made people more, more focused on like, you know, what's the point? Like, right. you know, that, that, that what, there's, that there's more than this and that, and that's okay. And we're going to live whatever we have here to the fullest because um, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, tomorrow, <laughs> but at the same time, we're all sort of all in this together. There's this huge sense of community. Um, there's a whole sense of spiritual community that um, I think that, that it's harder to find uh, definitely in this, in this modern. And that, exactly. And, you know, that's the thing that I, that we love exploring and, and in the first installment here of this story in season one and two of 1232 is, is that American idea of religion and church and Christianity and all that crap that has with it. Uh, and goes back to this slightly more pure form, though far more complex, because you know, you're dealing with uh, limited amounts of scripture available. You're dealing with you know, other old traditions that are hearkening towards worship and then you've got the physical struggle but there's so many fun things that finally people are debunking about medieval life you know like there was no color it was always gray it was always muddy and no. while it was gray it they didn't was comb muddy. their hair yeah, you know yeah. like they show these, the these movies teeth. and people are like you know and it's like no they bathed actually yes. they did all the time um, actually the in london in london there's a area that's called the stews but that was called that because that's where the Roman baths were. And then in the in the 10th century, they have boy they send the boys running through the streets. The water's hot. The water's hot. Come yeah. take a bath. And it's yeah. like people bathed. Yes. You know, they drank water. Yes. They you know they uh, they weren't short. You know, and I one of my most my it, most popular yes. posts on one of my most popular posts on my website is how tall people were mm -hmm. in like the Middle Ages or whatever, and particularly in Wales because again. Wales was not a was not didn't have cities. It was it was agricultural, but it was herding. So sheep and cattle and mm -hmm. goats. And so they had a high protein diet, lots of dairy, lots of meat. Um, and they've dug up graves and basically the you know, the average height of a man was five ten to six feet. Yeah. Back back in that era. And 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 then people started getting shorter as they moved into cities and their diet, the diet deteriorated. Exactly. Well, so yeah. The, the, yeah, the low was like height of men was like five, six in the, during the start of the industrial revolution. And it took like 300 years for them to recover, recover to a, exactly. a, a pre, you know, pre and like 
in Wales, they were full grown people. Well, I know, um, yeah, exactly. They weren't just little. And I love how people are like, oh, no, they have to be short because all the doorways are short. And it's like, no, that's to keep the heat in, you guys. I mean, come on, you know? And and also, if somebody, if you got somebody who doesn't know your house and they bonk their head or they go up the stairs and trip, you know, you know, you got somebody's not supposed to be there. Or, you well, know. Well, they also have like, um, Postroom gates. So like, yes, yeah. like you'll have a big gate and then you'll have this little short door. Mm -hmm. And it was so you could just open that a horse can't go through it. You can't yeah. attack through it. You have to step over a big threshold and you have to duck. Yes, right? Yeah, and, exactly. and it's like, that's not how tall they were. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they were four feet tall. They were four, yeah, that's, I know. And then, you know, the a peasant's meal is, you know, they didn't have time to grind their, their, wheat or you know mill it down to being white so they had brown bread you know it's like brown bread and salmon and vegetables is you know that's like a 40 dollar meal somewhere i know so exactly but for now. peasants that was an everyday thing you know and and the the, the more wealthy wanted the the more arduously made white bread, bread. <laughs> but, for you. you know yeah. that's yeah and, you know it's just so funny and i love that we're able to debunk so much of that i love that there's more authors spending time in the color that the so many castles were painted and and, and that so oh many... i know yeah so that's... there's trim in ireland trim castle mm -hmm. um where we went to visit at one point and it was like completely whitewashed white not now but like right. in the past and you think you look at it now and and everything's gray. And it's like, because the stone is gray, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's just because yeah. stone is gray. Yeah. It was whitewashed and then painted. Mm -hmm. um, all sorts of colors. Actually, if if you were to go to, have you been to um, St. Fagans, which is the National Museum of Wales? It's in, it's near Cardiff. Uh, no, um, it's a, to. it's a sort of a, a living, it's an exhibit, you know, that's mm -hmm. outdoors and they have, right. anyway, they've, um, rebuilt a sheese which is uh Schwellen's palace that was in oh, cool. north wales and they rebuilt it at st fagans and you walk inside and it's got red and i mean like painted all the walls are they're whitewashed but then they're painted as well yes. and you think oh right right yeah they liked color they did yes. like color yeah. and and it's not all gray well and um People yeah. are people, you know, women are going to want to redecorate their home or in their space. Like that's just, or men too, and you're going to want uh, to express yourself. It's not like people weren't expressing themselves. And then all of the terrific tales and stories and singing and oral traditions and all of it, it was so much more lively than people give it credit for. And so I love that, you know, through your, your stories and through your research, especially your videos, I love how you've gone through and you've gone to many of these holy places. You've gone to these castles. You teach us how to say them and you give us those history. I know that you're shifting gears with your videos, um, but there's listeners, there is five years of terrific videos on whales you get to walk through it with sarah and her husband i highly encourage you to subscribe to her channel on youtube where you'll also be able to watch our interview and go learn some welsh from somebody who knows how hard it is to to do it <laughs> and it's it's really fun because you know there really isn't enough welsh content on youtube whether it's speaking or history or whatnot we've got a few canned things a few bbc things but really what you guys got to do i think is just beautiful and i love that oh, well, so thank, thank you, you for those that's, videos that's that's lovely yeah it's five years you know i mean that was a that was some real soul searching going on to decide to like okay we need to step back um five years of of weekly like we did a video every week for five years that's amazing um, i can yeah. hardly do a video a week for a year <laughs> yeah well you know and, and and it's not like you planned we planned it right you know we just sort of it built on time. And then it's like, well, and my husband's a taskmaster. Let me just say, he's like, we have a video coming out. We need to do it. Good Write something. Yes. Um, but then we, but really, you know, we did it because we've been to all these places and we wanted to share them and give people, you know, it's so much more fun to go to um, where it was like Shen, Shen Vaglin, which is near Carnarvon and say, Hey, like, Here's a here's a ninth century gravestone that they've built into the church. I mean, how cool is that? And it's cool to look at, but it's even cooler to be able to share it with somebody. And so that was really the a lot of the driving force behind a lot of the videos we did. I mean, and, and the first year we did um, more of a telling a story, you know, like we started with the Celts and we sort of had the story going Seriously. on. And then we did religion the second year. 
um, and uh, and then sort of made more like one off, like we visited these places and so on. But but all of it was in the in the idea of like sharing what we knew beyond the books, right? And I obviously I love sharing the books, yeah. but um, but we there was so much. There's just so much more there that people wanted to delve in. A little bit more. Absolutely, absolutely. And speaking of books, you have a new one coming out March 29th, and that is going to be available everywhere you get your books. Is it also going to be dropping as an audio book on the 29th? Or is not on the 29th. Okay. Not on the 29th. Um, just the it takes too long. They take so much longer to make uh, audio books than, and I have to finish them. It, it's been done for um, nearly a month now, and my audit, my narrator has it, but um, but it'll it'll it, it's coming. So, but there'll be um, on the 29th, We'll have ebook, paperback, and hardback, Excellent. Um, and, and it's for pre order now. And so this is the 16th book in yep. the Garrison Glen Medieval Mysteries, Mysteries. which yes, yeah. yes, and which actually take place. Um, the Good Night is the first book. It's actually free in ebook. Um, and it's set in 1143, which yeah. I just have to call back to Mad Dog. Yes. Um, because, <laughs> because when I first started researching the Gareth and Gwyn Medieval Mysteries set in 1143, during the time, the reign of Owen Gwyneth, mm -hmm. um, I was skeptical about Mad Dog. I mean, I've read all the stuff and all the right. books about it, but you know, like, oh, really? Some yeah. Welsh, you know, everybody wants to have discovered America, you know, like, yeah. but then when I learned, and this is a, a huge spoiler for the series, so I apologize for that. But in 1170, when he was supposed to have set sail, um, was the year Owen Gwyneth died and Mad Dog was one of his sons. And Oh, and Gwyneth had like 17 sons or 25 or however, an enormous number of sons. Okay. Yeah. And two of the, the two youngest conspired to murder all their brothers. And so there was this war, general warfare, um, foisted upon the other, say 17 mm -hmm. by these younger two and Mad Dog was one of them. So instead of fighting, he, he sailed for America. And on top of which, they all have cause they're they're all related to the Irish and all the Danes who settled in Dublin and and Iceland and Newfoundland. So everybody knew about America. Yeah. In eleven seventy. Exactly. Everybody knew. They didn't call it America, but they knew right. about the Viking settlements in or the Danish in settlements Danish, yeah. in, in Newfoundland. And so it's to me it was like, oh, like like that's actually reasonable now that he right. would have said, I'm going off with my cousins. You know, We're don't worry about me. Yeah. I'm I'm gonna do my own thing. No I don't need to fight you. Yet. Yeah, I'm gone. Um, so anyway, so my my books were up to eleven fifty now, okay. um, from eleven forty three to eleven fifty. And this is the sixteenth book in the series about that that family. That's fun. I think listeners, you know, twelve thirty two episode uh well, I don't know exactly when this will drop, but you would have just received an episode. We have 31 in season one. This is a really fun, long tale. And if you just don't want good books, good stories to end, Sarah Woodbury has 50. I mean, you've got book 16 coming out in a series. You've got 20 in, uh, in another. And this is, this, is exactly, this is exactly the content you're looking for, people. These are exactly the series and books you're looking for. Um, when you're wanting to just ingest and binge read to your heart's content. So definitely please check out Sarah Woodbury has been my guest for this special bonus episode where we have talked a lot about whales. There's so much more. I feel like we barely scratched the surface on, you know, your experience there, your writing, but I really appreciate the different things we've been able to cover your process, your lifestyle as an artist and a mom, and how your husband and you got to work together, kind of build your own publishing house. And and now we're being able to, to be in Wales. This is 18 years of extreme hard work. And what a beautiful season you're at right now. Who, who knows what the next yeah. 18's got for you though? <laughs> I don't know, don't know, but looking forward to it. Exactly. So I've got just a couple more questions for you here. And one of them is, you know, what's the one thing that keeps you going, that has kept you going, the rejections, the homeschooling, the, the chaos, what's the one thing that's kept you going? Yeah, the, 
so the first five years aside in a sense before I started publishing but honestly it it's it's the community that has arisen sort of out of out of the writing and we were just saying today so I have a um, I haven't, you know, Facebook author page, but we have a, a book club um, that you have to ask to join. It's sort of, it's private in that sense, but there's like 1200 people in it. So it's not like that private, um, but to join where people talk about whales and the books and their kids and cats and this kind of thing. And it's just such a sweet thing. And, and, and through that, I have met so many lovely people who they love my books, but there also has been a way to connect someone in Germany with someone I went to high school with, you know, that that's like this community of people who just really um, in, like the same things I like, you know, that a way to, to have this lovely little haven on the internet. And, and it, the book club aside, it's like every single day I get emails from readers. Um, every single day I hear I, I I get to be part of a community that I never would have even how, how would I how would I even have done that um yeah. without writing the books? And and I'm just so grateful for for those connections. I mean, here I am in Wales. <laughs> um and uh and you know, how did I, how did I get here? You know, I'm good friends with, with a, with a lovely young, lovely young 87 year old woman who's fluent in Welsh, um, right. who knows me because she read my books. And then we reached out, you know, we had a meetup or whatever. And now, you know, I spent three hours with her yesterday talking in Welsh and, and how did I get so lucky? You know, that's, right. that's, it's just those kinds of things that, whereas, you know, if sales are down, if I have one star reviews, um, it's like, that doesn't matter. You know, that, that, that doesn't matter in the long run when, when, as long as I um, can bring joy and be a service to a whole bunch of other people. And, you know, and that's one of the things too, because I, I get email from people who they're doing, getting chemo, you know, and they're listening to my books. I, I give away free audiobooks to anybody who's having medical issues because it's like, you want to, you have, you have to have chemo, listen to daughter of time, you know, that that's just so much, so much better. And to know that, you know, someone's mother died and, and they wanted to use a passage from one of my books at the funeral. I was like, how could I be more honored than that? Yeah, that's, you know, so. That's beautiful. Exactly. Those personal connections and being able to impact people in that way it as a storyteller yeah that is definitely a beautiful thing to keep you going and one last question for you sarah and we want to thank you again for being on the show and folks i'm going to have all the links to sarah's audiobooks her ebooks her new release her website her youtube in the description below please go follow her i think you're going to want to i i feel like you did a wonderful sales pitch on on your books and stories so i don't think i have to do much for you but i really appreciate you taking the time and, and we'll have all that info for you guys and of course check out 1232 which is nothing like footsteps in time but at the same time it is very exactly like it exactly yes. like it <laughs> Uh, now I've got to start, you know, really digging into that, that series. I've stayed away from, from Sarah's series there on that one. Cause I'm like, I can't have it influence me. Um, but now I'm going to get to dig in and, and we'll, we'll get to compare some notes. If you get to listen to 1232, um, uh, I'm very nervous and intimidated, but if you do enjoy <laughs> the alternate history to your alternate history, <laughs> but here's the final question. And it's kind of a strange one, but I want to get your opinion on the state of, of writing and books today. So what's the one thing in the book world that we aren't talking about, but really should be? Well, you know, within, I think that there's two worlds now in the book world, the traditional world and the indie world. And, and what's unfortunate is that I think I think the traditional world barely knows we exist, but at the same time, um, I think that that the indie world is the world that's most creative. You know, like it's not corporate, right? Because mm -hmm. we're all hanging out here all, all by ourselves. Um, I also think that it's one of 
I know so many people making a living as a writer who are indie authors. And I know very few people who are traditional published authors who are making a living as an author. And I think that's because they're getting, um, they just get so much less out of that traditional world. And I, you know, and, and to me, I think that there's um, a, a way to, there, there ought to be more, a, a better way to, to talk to each other than mm -hmm. currently we have. Now I'm on, um, I'm the, involved in an organization called Novelist Inc. Uh, Nink, where, which, which is an organization for authors who have multiple books published. There's an income threshold. Mm -hmm. um, and through that as, as involved in membership, I like see contracts and stuff that cross people's debt, cross my desk. And, um, and, you know, and it's just like, it's not about the money per se, but I think that it's important when you start writing novels is to really be clear about what your goals are. Mm -hmm. Is your goal to be, you know, Stephen King? Like we all want to be Stephen King. I mean, <laughs> don't we really? I mean, seriously. But at the same time, it's like, are you, are you writing just because you have a story to tell that you just can't not tell? Um, I think that was in a way the case, you know, initially for me and for you, mm -hmm. it's like, you have to tell the story. This is, you know, okay. this is, but then like, where do you go from there? Is this, is this a career, is this going to be a career or is this, um, a one-off? And, um, and I think, um, that it's, it's like a, being a writer is something that everybody does individually, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's, um, it's something that we all it's like we experience it together individually. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and I, I wish that there was a way that we that um, that there was to really have authors really trust each other a little bit more. I mean, I think mm -hmm. indie authors do, but 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 I, but you know the the way these two worlds are separated, I think, um, is unfortunate. And I'd like to see I'd like to see fewer NDAs and, and, and more um, ability for authors to really connect with each other. Because I think that is actually a whole nother community, which I have also been incredibly grateful for, um, that I didn't know exist when I started out, right. but, um, but does exist. And, and most, you know, authors are, they're, we're all hanging out here, <laughs> typing away on our laptops, you know, yeah. by ourselves. And, and sometimes it's just really great to know that there's other people out there who have similar experiences. So. Absolutely. You know, that's a very publishing world. That's a, that's a very nitty gritty kind of answer. I like it though. That's that's great. You know, I think I think that holds a lot of relevance today, especially as the world just kind of wants to keep us on those islands. You know, whether it's through screens, opinions, uh, all the craziness that's going on with with everyone everywhere. And I think that as storytellers, it is absolutely our duty to come together, continue the traditions make the king laugh, accuse the king of treachery. <laughs> yes, it's you right. Know, and, and it's like, be, it's all the job. Exactly. It's, you know, be the, the bards that we were born to be. And, and I really love that you and I get to connect with that, that we have this incredible, almost spiritual, but mystical connection with whales. And I just think that it's, it's a beautiful place. Highly encourage people to look into it and to visit it when they can, and to treat the locals with respect and love because that's what that's exactly what they do for you. So yeah, um, absolutely. Well, Sarah, gosh, this was awesome. I could talk to you all day, so I better stop. I better stop now. But thank you for coming on. We so appreciate it, folks. Thank you for listening to Twelve Thirty Two and the special episode for the Never Drop Your Sword podcast. And we will see you again. Make sure you tune in for new 1232 episodes every Wednesday. And stay courageous. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome out.